In 1986, 38-year-old Nancy Jane Dardy, a mother of two, was living in Chisholm, Minnesota. She worked as an aide at the Heritage Manor Nursing Home and also volunteered as an emergency medical technician for the Chisholm Ambulance Service. Her dedication to help others prompted her to go one step further. She decided to move to the Twin Cities, where she settled in Minneapolis to attend school to become a certified paramedic. On the night of July 15, 1986, Nancy went out with a friend, Brian Evenson. Brian was going to help her move some belongings into storage the next day. After enjoying the evening together, Brian dropped her back at her house around 1 a.m. before returning to his own home, promising that he'd be back the next day. As per the scheduled meeting, Brian went to Nancy's house on July 16, 1986, around 8 a.m. Upon arriving, he noticed that her doors were locked and the curtains were drawn. This seemed strange to him, considering this was uncharacteristic for Nancy. He called for her several times, but no one answered the door. Assuming that she might have gone to run some errands before the move, the friend decided to come back later. During the day, he returned several times, but everything appeared the same. He tried to reach her by phone several times, but there was no answer. Unable to reach her, he called police requesting a welfare check for Nancy. Deputies from the Chisholm Police Department used forced entry to get into Nancy's apartment and found her nude and lifeless body lying on her own bed. After securing the scene, her corpse was taken to the medical examiner's office where an autopsy was performed. The autopsy results concluded that Nancy had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death and that she died between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. Evidence at the crime scene indicated that a struggle had taken place both inside and outside her home. DNA was recovered from bodily fluids found on the victim, and fingernail scrapings were taken and uploaded to the criminal DNA database. However, no match was found. Desperate to gather more clues, investigators quickly began questioning neighbors in an attempt to get possible information regarding the night of the murder. That was when they came across a couple of girls from the neighborhood who were walking near Nancy's house at around 3 a.m., the girls told the investigators that while walking up the sidewalk opposite to Nancy's home, they heard something that sounded like choking sounds. But they decided to ignore the sounds and did not call the police, a decision that they would later deeply regret. Police next shifted their focus onto the people closest to Nancy. At the initial phase of investigation, investigators suspected Nancy's estranged husband, Jim Doherty, with whom Nancy was in the process of divorcing before her untimely demise. However, Jim was cleared as a suspect after investigators learned he was out of the country when the murder occurred. Over the years, investigators interviewed and collected DNA from more than 100 people in an attempt to identify a potential suspect. There were periodic case reviews over the years, but none led to any new leads or suspects in the case. Periodic DNA comparisons in the DNA database still did not turn up a match. Tens of thousands of dollars were offered in reward money, but even that did not bring about any new information. The murder garnered adequate media attention in the news, but that too only ended up providing dead ends. Investigators were still nowhere near identifying a suspect. With the case having remained dormant for years, in early 2020, the Chisholm Police Department decided to approach the Parabon Nanolabs to request aid in retesting the decades-old DNA evidence. Parabon Nanolabs specializes in using public genealogy databases to help the law enforcement to generate leads in cold cases. The lab coordinated with law enforcement and began developing the suspect's DNA profile from the decades-old DNA evidence. After scouring through the DNA databases, their hard work finally paid off and gave them the name of their suspect, Michael Carbo Jr. In 2020, 52-year-old Michael Carbo Jr. was living in Chisholm, Minnesota. He was only 17 years old when the murder took place and lived less than a mile from Nancy's home. He was a senior at Chisholm High School, the same high school Nancy's children attended. For more than three decades, Carbo lived in Chisholm but was never on the radar of law enforcement. To gather more conclusive evidence from Carbo, Deputies from the Chisholm Police Department began surveying his Lincoln Square apartment in Chisholm, where he lived alone. They collected a garbage bag that Carbo disposed of in a trash can. Inside the bag, they found tissues, a beer can, Q-tips, and some paper towels, with Carbo's DNA all over them. 
After testing and comparing Carbo's DNA with the DNA found at the scene of Nancy's murder, it was confirmed to be a 100% match. It was the first time that DNA technology had been used in Minnesota to solve a cold case. In July 2020, Michael Carbo Jr. was arrested at his home and charged with the murder of Nancy Doherty. His trial began in early August of 2022 in St. Louis County Court, where the prosecution argued that Michael Carbo Jr. sexually assaulted and murdered Nancy in her own home in 1986. Carbo claimed to have had consensual sex with the victim, but denied responsibility in her murder. His defense even indicated an alternative suspect. However, the prosecution said the murder was intertwined with the sexual assault, and there had been no probable evidence to show the presence of a different killer. On August 16, 2022, after nine hours of deliberation, the 12-member jury returned with a guilty verdict. On September 30, 2022, 36 years after the murder, Michael Carbo Jr. was sentenced to life in prison for the first-degree murder of Nancy Doherty while committing a criminal sexual act. Andrea Michelle Bowman was born on June 23, 1974, as Alexis Miranda Badger in New Orleans, Louisiana. At only five months of age, she was put up for adoption by her teenage mother because she was unable to care for her and her biological father was not interested in fatherhood. In January of 1975, Alexis was placed in foster care. After spending several months in a foster home, Alexis was adopted by Brenda and Dennis Bowman at the age of 21 months. Brenda was working as a store clerk, while Dennis had just been discharged from the Navy. The couple did not have any other children. They renamed her Andrea Michelle Bowman. After adopting Andrea, they moved back to their home state of Michigan. Andrea grew up as the only child of the Bowman couple. She had a bubbly and sweet personality. As a young girl, she loved to chat with friends and was passionate about playing the flute. However, she was growing up in a household that was far from perfect. The Bowman family had a reputation of coming across as strange to the neighbors, which resulted in Andrea being teased and bullied by her classmates. The family constantly moved from one place to another, prompting Andrea to switch schools multiple times. She did not have many friends at school. When she was of dating age, she had trouble with that as well. Other parents warned their sons to stay away from her, based on her family's reputation. But this was not the worst thing Andrea faced in her everyday life. Both Dennis and Brenda mistreated her on a daily basis, and she often went hungry. In December of 1987, when Brenda gave birth to her biological daughter, Vanessa, in the midst of the ongoing abuse, this gave Andrea a newfound hope. Andrea immediately jumped into her new role as a protective big sister to her newborn sibling. But the abuse never stopped. At one point, she confided in a classmate about the abuse, saying that she thought about leaving home but couldn't do so because she wanted to protect her little sister at any cost. In early 1989, her high school counselor learned she feared going home from school due to the abuse at her home and they contacted police. After being interviewed by the police, Andrea confessed that she was being molested by her adoptive father, Dennis. A social worker, accompanied by a police officer, confronted Dennis and Brenda about the allegations. However, both Dennis and Brenda denied all the allegations, instead claiming that Andrea was a rebellious child who had recently discovered that she'd been adopted into the family as an infant. Relying on their claims, police did not take Andrea's claims seriously. They advised Andrea that she needed to understand her responsibilities as a daughter and a sister, yet they advised the Bowmans to take all the necessary measures to ensure that any such situation would not occur again. Shortly after that incident, the Bowman family of four moved into a mobile home in Allegan County. On March 11, 1989, Dennis called the Holland Police Station and reported that 14-year-old Andrea had run away from the home after stealing $100 from him in search for her biological mother. Although the circumstances of the disappearance were bizarre, police believed Dennis's claims and Andrea was considered an adolescent runaway. Immediately after Andrea's disappearance, the Bowman family shifted to yet another residence on 136 Avenue in Monterey Township, Michigan. In the ensuing months after the mysterious vanishing of the 14-year-old, Brenda made several calls to police in which she stated that she'd been told of several sightings of Andrea where she dyed her hair blonde and looked visibly pregnant. 
Though none of these sightings could be substantiated, without any clues to follow, police questioned the Bowmans on several occasions. However, although Brenda and Dennis were both cooperative with police initially, as police conducted more and more interviews, they eventually stopped working with the police. Over the years, investigators observed some discrepancies in Dennis's story. Every time he talked to police, his story would change a bit. Suspecting that Dennis had something to do with his adoptive daughter's disappearance, police began digging deeper into his past. But they could have never expected what they were about to learn. In 1980, Dennis was arrested after he attempted to lure and assault an 18-year-old girl from West Olive, Michigan, into a wooded area by threatening her with a handgun. He pleaded guilty to the assault with intent to commit criminal sexual conduct after working out a deal with prosecutors. Though he was sentenced to five to 10 years in prison, he was released in February 1986 after serving the minimum five years. Despite this, investigators had no evidence to criminally implicate him in Andrea's disappearance. The case garnered national media attention. In 1993, Andrea's photograph was shown in the music video for the Soul Asylum song, Runaway Train, along with other missing children. Despite this, Andrea's disappearance remained a mystery for many years to follow. In 1998, Dennis Bowman was again arrested for breaking and entering the home of a co-worker in Ottawa County to steal items, including the woman's lingerie. Before sentencing in the case, he referenced his missing daughter in a letter to the presiding judge saying that he's the loving father of two daughters, 125 and 111. However, he neglected to mention that his eldest daughter had been missing for over a decade at that point. He was eventually sentenced to just five years of probation for the crime. No progress was made in the case over the years. In 2002, Andrea's biological mother, Kathy Turkanian, set out to find Andrea. After struggling to find any information about her daughter, Kathy finally learned of her daughter's mysterious disappearance in 2010. From the beginning, she suspected Dennis after learning about the abuse allegations, but she had no proof, only mother's intuition. Andrea's fate remained unknown. That is, until 2019, when evidence from another crime would shed some light onto this case. In November 2019, the then 71-year-old Dennis Bowman was arrested for the unsolved homicide of 25-year-old Kathleen Doyle in Norfolk, Virginia, which occurred on September 11, 1980. DNA evidence implicated him in the crime after four decades. During the time of Kathleen's murder, Bowman had been in the midst of the court proceedings for his attempted assault of the 18-year-old. He did not attend court hearings for a two-week period in September 1980, claiming he was a member of the United States Army and was required to attend a two-week summer camp. In early February 2020, Dennis Bowman, while incarcerated and awaiting trial for the murder of Kathleen Doyle, was ready to come forward with information about Andrea. He finally confessed to police that he had murdered his adoptive daughter. He alleged that on March 11, 1989, he got into a heated argument with Andrea when she threatened him, saying that she would again report about the sexual abuse. Losing his temper, Dennis slapped and punched her, causing her to lose her balance and fall down the stairs. He claimed that he was afraid that he'd be handed a life sentence if he confessed to what happened. So, instead of calling for help, he hit her body in the barn out back on Lincoln Road. Then he called the police to report that she ran away from home. However, he said that he moved the remains a year later when his family moved into the house in Hamilton. Detectives discovered Andrea's remains in a number of garbage bags in a barrel buried in the back of the couple's Monterey Township home. In August 2020, Dennis Bowman was charged with one count of first-degree murder, first-degree child abuse, and mutilation of a dead body. The autopsy performed on Andrea's skeletal remains suggested that there was evidence of sharp force and blunt force trauma. The medical examiner stated that a sharp-edged tool was likely used in the mutilation of the body. As the investigators confronted him with the information, he came clean saying that he had put the girl's body into a cardboard barrel, which was too small to fit the whole body. So he chopped her body up with a machete and an axe to make it fit. He put the victim's body parts in four bags and buried them in his backyard, until a year later when he dug them up and reburied them in the backyard of his new house in Hamilton. On December 22, 2021, Dennis, who was already serving a life sentence for the murder of Kathleen Doyle, 
pleaded no contest to second-degree murder in the death of Andrea Bowman. On February 7, 2022, he received an additional 35 to 50 years in prison for Andrea's murder. On November 13, 1983, Deputies from the Delray Beach Police Department responded to a call regarding a motorcyclist finding a female body near an Amtrak station around 7.10 a.m. When police reached the scene, they found the lifeless and brutalized body of a young woman in the 1700 block of Depot Avenue in Broward County, Florida. The woman was Caucasian, in her early 20s, with reddish-brown hair. A knife was also found near the body. Investigators theorized that she was waiting for a train at the local Amtrak station when she was attacked, beaten to death, and viciously run over by a car. The investigators searched the area for hours, all the while talking to the locals, but nobody had seen anyone or anything suspicious. The woman was soon identified as 21-year-old Carla Lowe. Carla Lowe was born on December 10, 1961. She was described as a sweet and generous person who took care of everybody. She had a close relationship with her family. True to her caring nature, even at a very young age, she looked after her sister's children while her sister was at work. She was always willing to help if somebody needed it. In fact, she had spent over an hour on the day of her death helping a woman whose vehicle stalled. In 1983, Carla was living in Pompano Beach, Florida. Her family was devastated to learn of the brutal demise of their beloved Carla. Her body was so severely disfigured that they had to hold a closed casket funeral. The family wanted nothing more than to confront the person who was responsible for the tragic death of their loved one, but investigators had no clue who the killer could be. Upon digging deeper, investigators found that Carla's last conversation was with a close friend. They also discovered that Carla's younger sister, Jacqueline, who was just 18 at the time, was supposed to go to the station with her sister on that fateful day, but she changed her mind and Carla went alone. Her 1963 Mercury Comet was found parked at the 1100 block of West Atlantic Avenue later on the same day that her body was found. The crime scene did not betray many clues or evidence to point to a suspect, and no witnesses had come forward either. The medical examiner's office ruled the cause of death as a result of blunt force trauma, but that's about the only information they got. Without much to go on, the case soon turned cold and remained that way for nearly 40 years. In 2005, detectives reopened the case and conducted DNA testing on the knife found with her body in an attempt to find further evidence, but the results were not fruitful. So the case froze over once again. Then in 2021, a new piece of evidence led to a breakthrough in the case. That year, cold case detective Todd Clancy was assigned the case and immediately reopened the investigation. He spoke with the retired detectives who initially worked on this case in 1983 to try to gain more insight. Having exhausted all other options, Detective Clancy opted to use new DNA technology from a UK-based company named Foster & Freeman for assistance. The company offers a technology called Recover, in the form of a chemical vapor fuming process to develop fingerprints on a range of difficult surfaces, including those that have been exposed to extreme heat, such as bullet casings, and items that have been washed in an attempt to prevent identification. Using this technology, detectives were able to get a fingerprint, but did not disclose what item was used. The fingerprint linked to 59-year-old Ralph Williams, a longtime Florida resident. Back in 1983, on the same day that Carla's body was found, detectives had arrested Ralph on unrelated grand theft auto and burglary charges. However, this was not the first time he'd been looked at as a suspect in Carla's murder. An investigation was launched on him in relation to the murder of Carla after his fellow inmates told the investigators that he'd confessed to her murder. While searching his home, detectives found a chunk of bloody reddish hair, but shockingly, that was not enough to link him to the crime. Without any further evidence, charges could not be filed against him, which caused the case to lay dormant for years. Ralph's extensive criminal record shows more than 20 arrests across Florida on charges that include burglary, resisting an officer with violence, robbery with a gun or deadly weapon, selling, manufacturing, or delivery of heroin and marijuana, and possession of burglary tools. On November 30, 2021, Ralph Williams was arrested from his home at Jacksonville, Florida for the murder of Carla Lowe. 
Detectives concluded that he'd neither any connection to the victim nor any motive for the murder. However, some belongings were taken from her. After spending a year in jail, finally, in November 2022, he was offered a deal from the prosecution. Although he initially rejected the plea deal, saying he was dissatisfied with his public defense team and sought to hire his own attorney, he soon had a change of heart which prompted him to accept the plea deal. Under the terms of the plea, he pleaded to the lesser charge of manslaughter with a weapon and was sentenced to only one year in prison and ten years of probation. Since he already served one year in jail, he was credited for the time served and was released. The victim's family was understandably upset with this outcome. Carla's sister, Jacqueline Lowe Repass, stated that it was not justice. She further said that she and other family members didn't really want a plea to begin with, but they understood why it was presented. Despite the anger, they have accepted the outcome. Between 1990 and 1999, Myers Park, an affluent neighborhood in Charlotte, North Carolina, was shocked and scared to its core as a serial rapist preyed on young girls in and around the area. The string of tragic incidents began on June 13, 1990. On that day, deputies from the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department responded to a home on Maryland Avenue, but they did not anticipate that this was the beginning of many sleepless nights for the community, as well as detectives in search of the perpetrator. The victim was a teenage girl who stated that a man broke into her home and sexually assaulted her. However, she could not provide a proper description of her attacker, given the fact that he was wearing a ski mask and was careful not to leave behind any evidence. While police were still trying to figure out how to proceed with their investigation with no description or evidence, a similar sexual assault occurred in the same area just a few miles away. This man was just getting started inflicting his wrath upon this community. Over the course of the next nine years, the perpetrator wreaked havoc on the people of Myers Park by committing a total of 15 sexual assaults on young girls. The last attack was reported on January 9, 1999, on Highview Road in Myers Park. Of these 15 cases, the oldest victim was 18 years old. The youngest was only three years old. Every one of these assaults were very similar, and the modus operandi was unique. Police concluded that they were conducted by the same person. However, they were short of clues to conduct a proper investigation. At that point, they had only a generic description of the attacker. He was described as standing between 5'2 and 5'4 and aged between 20 to 30 years with a muscular build. The man wore dark ski mask and gloves with a dark jacket and dark trousers. His race or ethnicity could not be identified at the time due to conflicting information from the victims. While some victims identified him as Hispanic, some thought he was Caucasian. In the majority of the attacks, the suspect, armed with a knife, broke into a home and moved the young victim to a different location where he sexually assaulted them. However, none were fatally harmed and were released thereafter. After 1999, the attacks abruptly stopped, despite law enforcement not being any closer to catching the perpetrator. This led investigators to believe that the assailant most likely moved to a new place, was arrested, or died. But nothing could be said conclusively. By this point, the media had given him the moniker the Myers Park Rapist. But that didn't stop the investigators pouring their effort into the case. They put countless man-hours into searching for the suspect. Over the years, they had multiple suspects, but could still not conclusively identify the assailant. As years passed, the investigation stalled and only a few investigators were actively working the case. The Myers Park serial rapist case finally heated up again in 2006 when CMPD formed its Sexual Assault Cold Case Unit with the goal of solving all the cold cases related to sexual assault in the area. And it's no wonder that this case was their top priority. Experienced detective and CMPD police sergeant Daryl Price was leading this unit. By this time, DNA technology had evolved and DNA was found on secondary items in one of the sexual assault cases. Back in the 90s, sexual assault kits were only testing for blood type serology, which is an examination of blood serums that look for pathogens and immune responses to see if the person may have had a disease. However, in the 2000s, DNA testing was becoming more and more commonplace and later became an integral part of solving the cold cases. In 2009, 
66-year-old Gilbert McNair, who also committed a series of rapes between 1990 to 1998 in the Charlotte area, was arrested. This led everyone to believe that he was the only man responsible for all the sexual assaults. He used break-in methods which were consistent with these 15 assaults, which reassured the victims, as well as the public, that the culprit had been brought to justice when he was sentenced to 36 years in prison in 2011. However, he had only been linked and convicted of sexually assaulting two women between 1990 and 1998 on Crescent Avenue, who were 21 and 28, whereas 13 of those 15 victims were under the age of 18. Soon it became apparent to law enforcement that another perpetrator was still on the loose. But finding a suspect who wore a mask and gloves, leaving behind almost no evidence, was still proving to be a challenge for the investigators. It would take them more than a decade before investigators finally got the breakthrough they needed. In 2019, a DNA profile was developed from the DNA collected and preserved from the crime scenes. However, they did not find a match when it was uploaded to CODIS. In December 2021, with the help of the Sexual Assault Initiative Grant and Parabon Nanolab, Extensive investigation through forensic genetic genealogy testing allowed police to narrow their suspect list to one person, David Edward Doran from Charlotte, North Carolina. Although Doran didn't live in Myers Park, he did target the neighborhood as a cat burglar who broke into houses during the night and stole the valuables and jewelry, some distant family members of Doran told police. However, no accounts of sexual assaults were ever mentioned. Doran was no stranger to police. In 2001, Dorn was convicted for possession of burglary tools. He also had multiple traffic offenses and an assault inflicting serious injury charge, yet he was found not guilty for those charges in 2004. In addition, he had a felony offering bribes charge from 2005, which was also later dismissed. Unfortunately, his DNA was never entered into the CODIS database. Thus, he was never on the radar of investigators for these sexual assaults until genetic genealogy finally unmasked him. Law enforcement agencies across the country are speculating that Doran could be responsible for as many as 50 sexual assaults throughout the U.S. because he lived in several states, including California, Texas, and Ohio. He would have been 49 years old in 1990 when the first attack took place in Charlotte. However, in a press conference regarding the identification of the infamous Myers Park rapist, CMPD Police Sergeant Daryl Price said, People don't become a rapist at 49 years old. Throughout his younger years, I'm certain he's done this all across the country. Sadly, he would never face justice, as he died on June 24, 2008, at the age of 67. Police stated that, if he would have been alive, they would have had enough evidence to charge him for all of these crimes. CMPD also reached out to each victim regarding the information about their assailant. There was a mixture of feelings. They were all grateful, Price stated. On September 26, 1984, 58-year-old mother of 11 adults, Mary McLaughlin, was enjoying a night out drinking and playing dominoes in the Highland Pub, now the Duck Club, near Mansfield Park in the west end of Glasgow, Scotland. It was not long before one of her daughters, Catherine Mullen, joined her at the club. After enjoying the evening together, Catherine left the pub to catch a bus home, leaving her mother behind. She had no idea that she would never see her mother again. Mary left the pub at about 10.45 p.m. and headed to her Partick apartment, which was less than a mile from the pub. On the way, she stopped by Armando's chip shop on Dunbarton Road, where she bought fritters and cigarettes. Mary was in a jovial mood, as she often was, joking and laughing with the store staff before leaving the store. One of the staff members noticed a man following Mary. That was the last time anyone saw Mary alive. Her family grew concerned when nobody had heard from Mary in the following days. On October 6, 1984, six days after the last sighting of her, one of Mary's sons, Martin Cullen, paid a visit to his mother's house to check on her. The doors were locked, and there was a foul odor emanating from the apartment. Nobody answered the door, even after repeated knocks. Martin obtained a spare key from Mary's neighbor, but it didn't work. Eventually, he entered the apartment by kicking the door in. Once inside the apartment, he was greeted with a horrific scene. His mother's lifeless body was lying on her back in her bed with a ligature around her neck. Her right arm was hanging off the side of the bed 
and her legs were spread apart. Her green dressing gown was on backwards, and the belt of the gown was around her neck. Her dentures were lying on the floor beside the bed. Shocked and heartbroken, he called the police. Police did not find much evidence that could lead them to a possible suspect. The post-mortem examination concluded that Mary had been strangled to death at least five days prior to when she was found, indicating that she had probably been killed the same night she was last seen alive. She had extensive injuries, including the visible ligature mark. Without the availability of DNA technology, CCTV footage, or any other digital trails, police in 1984 had very little to go on. Despite taking hundreds of statements from people in the local community, officers from the then Strathclyde Police Department did not come across any witnesses. Other than the periodic reviews, the case lay dormant for years. On four separate occasions, in 2002, 2004, 2006, and 2008, forensic evidence was tested with no significant breakthrough to follow up on. In 2014, the Daily Record ran an episode on Mary McLaughlin's murder on a series called Unsolved. Shortly after the episode aired, a fifth review was launched, and this time, scientists were finally able to develop a profile of an unidentified male from the DNA that was found in a knot tied by the killer on the belt of her dressing gown, the gown itself, and a cigarette butt found at the scene. It would take five more years before detectives were finally able to positively identify the suspect. Thirty-five years after Mary was stalked and murdered in her own home, police named 59-year-old Graham McGill as the culprit. In 1981, at just 20 years old, McGill was convicted for sexual assault and sentenced to six years in prison. However, in 1984, at age 23, due to good behavior, he was able to participate in a Training for Freedom program. This program was meant to prepare him for re-entry into society. As part of this program, McGill was granted a weekend release from prison. On the last night of his release, he crossed paths with Mary McLaughlin. On the fateful night of September 26, 1984, McGill, who was unknown to the area, somehow came across Mary while she was on the way to her home. Taking advantage of Mary's trusting and friendly nature, McGill, who was half her age, struck up a conversation with her. She then allowed him to accompany her back to her apartment where she lived alone. Once McGill entered her third floor flat, he launched a sexually motivated attack on the unsuspecting Mary. Though she tried to fight back, she was no match for her attacker, who brutally strangled her to death with her own nightgown and fled the scene after locking the door from outside, leaving her to rot there. Although he eluded law enforcement for this crime, in 1999, he was sentenced to life imprisonment for the attempted sexual assault of a 24-year-old woman, yet he was released on license in 2007. On December 4, 2019, McGill was arrested at his home in Glasgow. He was visibly confused. Perhaps he never expected his past to come back to bite him after 35 years. Then again, as a serial offender, perhaps he was confused about which assault he was being arrested for. If the DNA evidence was not enough, McGill's former wife testified in court that in 1988, he confessed to murdering a woman because he wanted to know what it felt like to take a life. The wife never went to police with this information because he threatened to kill her. Yet despite all the evidence against him, to this day, McGill continues to deny all the allegations of sexual assault as well as the murder. Finally, in May of 2021, Graham McGill was sentenced to 14 years in prison for the brutal slaying of Mary McLaughlin in 1984. While the victim's family was happy that justice was finally served, they were disappointed at the length of the sentence. They also expressed their dismay, saying that he should have never been released in the first place. Closure is a tricky thing to talk about, especially to the victims of the cold cases or their families. We can only hope that they can find some solace through the answers they waited for so long to get. Let us know your thoughts on these cases in the comment section below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more captivating videos like this.